Nancy Bickle, uh, the president of the League of Women Voters of Berkeley, Albany, and Emeryville. So we're very delighted to be showing our face here in Emeryville. We hope to do it more in future. And of course, we welcome people to join, men and women. But now to the business for this evening. Uh, tonight, we are talking to the can four candidates for city council. I believe there are two seats open on the council, so there's a real contest going on here. The League has prepared questions for the candidates, but members of the audience will also be submitting questions. Leaguers will be circulating in the audience with cards and pencils, so you can write down your questions very clearly. Just wave us over and send questions to the League members who are reviewing them and organizing them. Uh, please keep your questions brief. Now I'd like to introduce the four candidates running for the Emory Ville City Council positions. From the left, please welcome John J. Bouters, Ken Bukowski, Scott Donahue, and Diane Martinez. Every candidate, uh, we've discussed with the, the rules with the candidates, but we'd like the people in the audience to know what we've told them. Every candidate will answer every question. The answers will be one minute long. We'll alternate so everyone will get a chance to be first, last, and in the middle. Uh, we encourage the candidates to tell the voters their own views rather than criticizing other candidates. Uh, but we have provisions if there are any personal attacks, the one who might be attacked or criticized will have a chance to respond. And so, let us begin. I'm going to be marching down the row and then recircling. Um, my first question will start with John Bouters, and it's a simple, straightforward one. What do you think are the highest priority needs for Emeryville as a whole? Thank you, Nancy. Um, I would like to begin first just by thanking the League for, on behalf of everyone, I know that we appreciate the opportunity to meet and engage in voters in a forum like this where we can all discuss our views, so appreciate that very much. The biggest priorities I see before the city of Emeryville for the coming four or five years in the foreseeable future are basically three things I'm going to talk about real briefly. One is the need to increase the affordability of our community. Uh, our communities grown dramatically in the last five years, in the last 10 years even. And we are seeing an increasing number of people who have been the long-term residents, seniors, people who are on fixed incomes, are not able to remain part of our community because they're being priced out. And we need to do something about that. Um, we have some challenges with affordable housing law, but there are things that we can do and policies we can set that can correct that course. Second is that we need to partner with the neighboring communities in the East Bay, and we need to attack the issue of the minimum wage. Um, and third, we need to talk about how people enjoy recreation and build community here. And I have a number of ideas on that as well. Um, dog parks are an important thing for our community. Bike and ped space is an important thing that people need here. And civic centers are something that we can do. And the ECCL is a great example of how we're building towards that. Thank you. Thank you. Ken, would you please respond? Yeah, hi, my name is Ken Bukowski. I'm running for city council. Uh, I have a number of ideas that I think uh, we need to carry out in the community. First of all, I think we need a structure for public involvement and exchange of information. There is no time, no regular time when the public gets to have input. For example, the city council hasn't had a retreat for five years. I think that's really important because the, the community is not involved in the decisions that are being made. So I'd like to see us have uh, a semi-annual meeting with the community where the mayor and the city manager and the council members can meet the, uh, come out and meet the community, explain what our goals and objectives are, where neighbors can meet neighbors. Some regular opportunity for people to express themselves and to be involved. Because if that's not provided, then they're only involved when certain important issues come along that affect them. So we need to start uh, bringing the community together that way. Um, so that's, that's my thought. Thank you. Thank you. Scott. Emeryville is entering a new era. It might not seem like it to everyone, but our economic system has changed. Our redevelopment agency no longer exists. We have a balanced budget right now for our general fund, but our capital funds for building new things for our future growing population 
is not very well covered in our current system where we've lost the redevelopment agency. So we have to really pay attention to how we can grow our city and our city is putting uh, many new people here and it's a good thing. We need to grow our city, play our part in the center of the Bay Area. If we can do this well, we'll all have a good life and livability is a major issue and this is something we need to address going forward. Thank you. Diane. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, League of Women Voters, for having us this evening. Um, this may be weighing on my mind because of the recent seismic activity in Napa, but I, and also as a mother, I'm very concerned with public safety in uh, special regard to the emergency services that we have here in Emeryville. I recently had uh, the opportunity to spend time with the Alameda County Fire Department and take a look at the specialized services that they're able to provide that we uh, didn't necessarily have access to before we uh, regionalized. So I think it's an ongoing issue to protect our public safety services to make sure that they're adequately staffed and supported. Uh, again, as a mother and as a, as a citizen. I personally have some issues uh, where I'm interested in bicycle pedestrian issues and um, affordable housing as well, but I understand I'm coming to the close of my time. Thank you. Well, you have stepped right into and led right up to a question that we were going to ask about emergency preparedness. So we'll give everybody a crack at that topic. Are the buildings in Emeryville uh, and the people prepared for a quake, like the recent 6.1 Napa quake. And um, I'm thinking that it should be Ken who starts this question. Okay, are we prepared? Uh, I don't know that we're adequately prepared. We're better prepared than we used to be. We, we have an emergency plan. Uh, a number of years ago, the council members were invited to uh, Alameda County where they have a, a control center, and the council members did get to experience what the control center would be like. I don't know if that's done recently, but uh, we, um, we have a disaster plan, and I'm not sure that it's um, adequately um, publicized uh, or people are told what they can do. I think we need to step up to the plate and do a little bit more of that. Uh, at one point I served on a Watergate Emergency Preparedness Committee and a lot of the work was already done over there and um, I don't know where that is today but people were counting how far it was to the ne nearest staircase and how to get down from their balcony and uh, what emergency items that they needed to have in the event of a quake and I, I think we can do a better job of putting that together for the community. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Scott. Our city uh, is an unusual city in that we have old and new structures. Is our, our emergency services really prepared for the true variety of emergencies that we could have in a major earthquake? And I think the truth is, is that we are marginally prepared, only really an idea. We have a ways to go. We have facilities that make very specialized biochemical agents. We have uh, older structures that uh, need to be addressed in their, uh, the safety of their seismic abilities. Thank you. Uh, I believe it's up to you again, Diane. You know, I, as I mentioned, I had the really wonderful opportunity to check out the specialized services provided by Alameda County Fire uh, Department. And I am convinced that uh, those members of our public service are, are adequately going to be able to take care of our needs. However, in the event of an earthquake or an other great natural disaster, I think what we could use is more emergency services in the way of neighborhood involvement. So more people learning, you know, how to do what to do before a first responder gets there. Um, and if I have a little bit more time, I am happy that we've got uh, a police department and a fire department on the peninsula just in case anything happens and we're, you know, the city is divided by seismic activity. Thank you. John. Thanks. This is a great question. Uh, so I had the ability 
prior to my current role, I was a disaster relief director for the Red Cross, and I coordinated disaster relief operations around the country. And so I've had my hand in this a little bit, and we always told people the number one rule is to be prepared. And so being prepared, your question went to structural integrity in the city. And I think if you look at our housing stock, we have two types of housing stock primarily. We have some of the buildings that were previously referenced. We have a lot of single family homes, uh, many that survived Loma Prieta. And then we have some uh, new structures, a lot of post-1995 development um, that's multi-unit family housing and multi-unit housing for individuals. And those have been developed with seismic regulations that were learned from Loma Prieta. And so I'm confident that some of, some of the buildings, the majority of our residential buildings, are actually structurally um, sound. But what I also want to remind people is that community education is the key to being prepared for a disaster. And I used to teach basic aid, CPR in, in, in schools in Los Angeles and teach adult and civic groups um, skills that they needed to respond to a disaster. And um, I would just encourage us to make sure that our plan properly accommodates those things. Thank you. So uh, Scott, uh, let's continue a little more on the disaster theme. Uh, Emeryville is also at sea level. And sea level is expected to rise over the next 20 to 50 or whatever years. And um, is the city prepared for quakes and flooding? Uh, and what needs to be done? We have um, much of our city in a liquefaction zone. I'm sorry to tell all of you that uh, the bayfront is really in danger of this liquefaction. Uh, I can say that some of the structures will do okay. Even the Watergate apartment complex, majority of those structures will do okay in a liquefaction event. Some of the cross members might not do so well. Uh, emergency preparedness is the key to this kind of an event. I think we need to work with our regional partners when it comes to rising sea level because we're going to need to address this on our shoreline. And there are federal funds for shoreline enhancement. We're going to need to be able to stay in touch with our federal officials for that. Thank you. Diane. So I'm sorry, could you repeat the question again, Nancy? Because I'm trying to detect the nuance between oh, this oh, and okay. the previous question. Of course question. I can. So Emeryville is at sea level, and the sea level is expected to rise in the next 20 to 50 years. Is the city prepared for quakes and flo uh, for flooding, I should say, because we've talked about quakes, and what needs to be done? So in terms of flooding, I'm definitely concerned about any buildings that are um, on landfill, which of which there are some. In Emeryville, I'm someone who likes to look up old photographs and maps of where I live. And um, I was surprised when I moved here to find uh, maps that didn't include the marina <laughs> as a structure in the city. So uh, as to the preparedness for the city to deal with flooding, I have to say I would need to do further study on that. But um, I definitely have a concern about it. Thank you. Uh, John. Thanks. To the specific question as to flooding, um, I, you know, I deployed for Katrina and we had flooding in an area that was below sea level, but a lot of people don't know that we had immense flooding in areas that were above sea level, and Emeryville is 23 feet above sea level, actually. Um, and being prepared requires a number of things. The Army Corps of Engineers, if we wanted to have federal involvement, the Army Corps of Engineers would need to be brought in to essentially figure out how to make our community safe from flooding in a seismic or other event. Um, but as a pragmatic answer to your question, we need to look at the cause of why we have flooding. Um, and that's because we have climate change. And so one of the things that I think is really important is we follow along with some of the great leadership we've had at the state level about how to address climate change. We've adopted a lot of policies in the past five years that will provide us better resources, better planning, transit-oriented development. We're talking about greenhouse gas reduction. We're putting a cap on pollution. Those are the long-term solutions, and those are the long-term forms of prevention to flooding. Um, but as to the specific infrastructure question, that would be something the federal government probably in partnership with the state would need to come in and do to make us actually safe. Thank you. Ken, please. Okay, uh, I don't think we're prepared for a flooding disaster. Yes, you're right. I think it's 22 feet, but, you know, we don't want to quibble over that. 
But uh, you know, one of the ideas I have for this community is to create a profile from every member of the community who wants to be participate. And by doing that, you're going to discover the resources we have out there, the skills that people have, things that people are interested in, and it's a way to bring people together in the event of a disaster. So I think there is a way to uh, get people involved and to identify uh, the resources necessary when one does happen. But uh, that's a huge problem, and we're probably going to need some assistance from outside agencies to find a solution. Thank you. Thank you. I think we start with you now, Diane. Um, we'll take up a different topic, another big one. Does the city have a good balance between jobs and housing? And within those categories, do we have a broad enough variety of kinds of businesses, and do we have a broad enough range of housing for people of all incomes and family sizes? And uh, types. That's a lot to address in 60 seconds, Nancy. Well, but, um, I, I know you all can do it. You well, let me just start with the, the, the balance of affordable housing. I think it's um, clear to everyone up here on the panel that we don't have enough affordable housing in Emeryville. I think that um, it's well known that we're, we're trying to meet those needs and we need to continue to do everything that we can to find creative ways to make sure that people who want to be on the path to home ownership have that access. I want families in Emeryville to be able to purchase a home here like I did, <laughs> like what my family did. So um, that's something I'm definitely concerned with. It's an, it's an overall issue that I think um, City Council has had to deal with for a long time here in Emeryville. And I think going forward, um, we're going to have to come up with even more creative solutions with the loss of redevelopment on how to do that. Mr. Donahue lives in a very interesting circumstance uh, in his artist co-op. And he could tell you about the funding structure of that. But that's one of those creative uh, ideas. Thank you. John. Thanks. So to answer your question, um, there is a very lacking middle range um, and a very lacking lower end. So we have probably close to be, so somewhere between two and three times as many people work in Emeryville than live here. And so the question becomes, there's a lot of well, there's a lot of people coming in from outside of the city, but how many of those people who actually of those jobs that are here that reflect residents as well? How many of those people are actually working here? And the reality is that not many of them are, um, and that's because we built a city that has a lot of business infrastructure and it has a lot of corporate and retail, and those individuals especially the ones who are making hourly wage jobs, can't afford to live here. Um, and that's a two-pronged problem. It's a great way to ask the question because we need to both make sure that we are bringing people up, that we are creating jobs or we're creating a situation where people can live, families can actually not just get by. The word minimum wage should be insulting to people, I think. They should be able to thrive. And we should balance that with the opportunities that we afford people with housing. Um, and affordable housing for a long time was a negative term. It was, you know, consistent with projects, but the reality is that people need to have a place that they can live so they can do the things that they can't otherwise do without their rent being less than 50% of what their annual income is. Thank you. Um, Ken. Yeah, well, the question was about a balance between jobs and housing, and I don't know that in a one square mile area you're going to be able to actually have that balance. That's more of a regional approach to the situation. Um, you know, one of the things we want to do is to try to have as many people work locally as possible. And one suggestion I've made over many years is that if we could give Emeryville employees a small business tax credit for each Emeryville employee, that once a year we could, you know, each business would, could apply for that credit, now we would know how many people are working, Emeryville people are working in, in Emeryville businesses. And if the city gave out some kind of an award for the, those businesses that had the most Emeryville employees each year per capita, then we would be um, encouraging people to live and work in the same community. And I think that would be a good, good first start. Um, it's, uh, but I think we need to work, look at the regional level. There's a lot of regional programs out there that uh, we just don't seem to be participating in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Scott. If Emeryville could do more to make our city tied in in its transportation network with the rest of the Bay so that people could uh, effectively take public transit, walk and bicycle to, to and from our neighborhoods and cities, it would uh, make it easier for people to live closer to work. We have this problem where people come long distances to work here. And if we can make it easier to live uh, more conveniently by walking and cycling, 
uh, I think that it would save a lot of expense for uh, driving long distances. We should make our city more complete by having more housing itself here. And also, we should raise our minimum wage. If we can get a minimum wage regionally that's much higher, it would give more of our workers a chance to live locally. Thank you. Um, so we've had, people have touched on two aspects of how, or more than two, but it, two aspects of how to uh, make it possible for a greater range of people to live here. One is, um, raising the minimum wage to a livable wage, and the other is possibility of rent control. So uh, to what extent, and I think we start with you, John, do you think those two approaches would be helpful to the city? So as to the minimum wage, um, I think we really need to explore whether we want a minimum wage or a livable wage first. Um, and then in deciding whether we want a minimum wage, what that means for the people who are going to benefit from it. Um, and so I do believe pursuing that is important. I believe that the solution to that is a regional solution. Um, as a small city who has very big neighbors, we can't afford for the sake of our businesses and the sake of our residents and employees who come here, we can't afford to ignore the fact that we have to be a regional player in that. And I think that that's something that if I was put on council, I would work very hard to do as partner regionally. Um, as to rent control, the Bay Area is totally unaffordable for most people. Um, and I've worked as a lawyer for low income and seniors um, in housing law for seven years. And so I understand what rent stabilization does and how it benefits people. Um, but the unfortunate reality is that in California, we have a law called Costa Hawkins. And Costa Hawkins was passed in 95, and it excludes from rent control certain types of structures. And the reality of that is that most of the development that's here in Emeryville is ineligible for rent control, either because it's a single family home, it's an owner or tenant occupied condominium, or it was developed after 1995. So even though we would love it and I would be a huge advocate for it, the practical matter is that we probably won't be able to have rent control. Thank you. Ken? Yeah, I think some form of rent control is probably essential uh, because without it, I just see a turnover of people in the community constantly happening. And yeah, we have Costa Hawkins, but this doesn't mean it can't be overturned or defeated or that it couldn't change. Uh, as this affordability issue gets more and more um, crucial, I think there's going to be more movement to do that, and I, I think it's really necessary. So yes, I would certainly support that. You know, the city could adopt the minimum wage and then have an automatic exemption for people who don't qualify for the first two years. That would give the city the time to take a look at those individual circumstances, but make a statement right up and say, hey, you know, we want, we want uh, higher wages in Emmyville, and that's what we're all about. Um, you know, on the enforcement issue, I really think the state labor department should be enforcing uh, non-compliance, not that each individual jurisdiction would have its own enforcement. So you probably would want to get the region together to have the state add to its um, um, team of people that do that enforcement the fact to make the adjustment for the local uh, wage if it's higher than the other cities. Thank you. Thank you. Scott. So. There you, you heard, you know the two points. Repeat the two points yes. again. It's about Rent control as a solution and uh, a livable wage or minimum wage rise in Emeryville as solutions to the unaffordability of housing. And I, I think we do have to pay attention to our neighbors who are trying to raise the minimum wage to something that is uh, hopefully going to be approaching affordability or a, a a living wage that would make it possible for uh, people to live in some kind of distance from the city but also within the city we need to be more creative in how we do our affordable housing for example i live with my wife and many other artists at the emeryville artist co-op and each of our units when it turns over remains low to moderate income housing for and workspace for artists. And this is uh, a, a type of housing where you don't, the <coughs> assets are retained by the corporation, but the, the sale price is very reasonable because it's replacement costs of improvements. And I think the city could, has had a successful program with this and we could redo more of this and have more affordable housing. Thank you. Diane. Um, 
Let me just get this out of the way. I support raising the minimum wage, and I look forward to this happening very soon in Emeryville, whether I'm a part of it or not. Um, I have talked to representatives from the East Bay Alliance for a Sustainable Economy and SEIU 1021 and gotten their thoughts on the issue, and I look forward to um, seeing something done about this very important issue. Uh, in terms of rent control, um, to the extent that we can have it, it's something I would like to explore. I think the um, amount of rental units in Emeryville is staggering. I think at the Sherwin-Williams site, there is a proposal for uh, many, many more renters to come into the city. So perhaps maybe not for places where we're precluded from applying these rent controls. I think there is room to start asking for this type of regulation. And I think there's room to uh, have some oversight, possibly uh, in, in, the, in the sense of a rent stabilization board. But I think we need to do whatever we can to make homes affordable. Thank you. Um, well, here, we'll go to a somewhat more solvable, immediately solvable problem. Uh, uh, audience question says, I'm concerned about transportation for seniors, the long-term stability, stability of Emory Go Round, additional benches at bus stops, and financial support for the senior shuttle eight to go. Um, so now who are we at? Ken, I believe you are the one to start. Okay, um, well I certainly support um, the Emory Go Round. I've been working on, on that issue now for uh, the last couple of years. Uh, the, the support for the existing funding is going to be expiring, and we have to come up with a fair formula for the funding. Um, uh, my work at the Alameda County Transportation Commission this year, um, we, uh, the Property Owners Association, was going to come up with an alternative ballot measure for uh, half cent sales tax, and at the last minute, we got the county to uh, include funding for the Emmy Ground because it wasn't even possible. You know, we're given three and a half million dollars a year for the existing sales tax, and if it's increased uh, in November, we'll be giving them seven million dollars a year. And I think we should be getting about two million dollars back, at least, for the Emmy Ground, our most important transportation uh, need. Uh, most of that, a lot of that money goes to fund projects in southern Alameda County, like BART to Livermore. And so Emeryville has not been getting its fair share. In fact, if it wasn't for funding for the Emmy Ground, I wouldn't even support it now, because the northern California cities are not getting their fair share. Thank you. Scott? I definitely want to make our Emory Go Round stable, economically secure, and uh, our Elderly population absolutely needs this. All of Emeryville needs this service. This uh, property-based uh, improvement district law has changed recently. So the council has wisely proceeded on with uh, trying to come up with a new way to do the P-bid, perhaps more equitably for some of the businesses. And uh, I hope that we will be able to expand the base of uh, property owners uh, that will allow us to secure this for the, for our future, and uh, this service needs to not be just secured, but extended and built upon for our growing population. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Nancy. I'm not as familiar with the um, funding mode for eight to go. However, Emory Go Round is something that gets talked a lot about in my house. My three-year-old um, likes to ride it to the marina. But I was heartened at um, Tuesday City Council meeting to see the council move forward with a resolution to uh, create a new PBID. And for those of you who are watching at home, if you don't know, it's a it's a property-based business improvement district, and this is our chance to possibly in increase the assessment, as Scott has astutely noted, and possibly make it a more equitable distribution and, and provide more funding. And as Ken noted, Measure BB is coming up and might be able to provide a funding source as well for Emory Go Round. If I'm elected to council, I will keep a close eye on these issues because I think everyone agrees that Emory Go Round um, needs to stand on its own feet beyond 2016. Thank you. John. So if you care about public transit, you need to vote for Measure BB. Unabashedly, I will plug it right here. Um, Measure BB, which will be on the Alameda County ballot and 
barely failed in 2012, um, and now we've amended it so that it doesn't have a perpetuity um, allocation to it. It's going to be timed out. Um, so we can reevaluate it, which is a good thing, I think. Um, but Measure BB will do two things. It will provide um, funding both for infrastructure, transit stuff, and it will also provide it for operations. And the city will be in a position to apply for a grant to expand Emory Ground Services to do something I would like to see us do, which is pilot alternative and additional routes for Emory Go Round to make it more accessible to people. But one of the most important things about Emory Go Round and other services that would be funded through Measure BB is that it makes seniors independent. And we have a significant senior population and having worked with seniors for many years, um, I know how important it is to somebody to be able to have that type of freedom. And public transit and paratransit are the ways that people do that when they're older. Um, and they should have the ability to rely on that. And so I actually support diversifying the funding source for the Emory Go Round and for other forms of public transit that might be available. I believe that to the extent that we can have bike and pedestrian friendly um, routes available to people, that's good as well. But we definitely need to diversify the source of funding. I think everybody's answered that one. I think we're on to the next, and I believe it's Scott. Um, the Emeryville Center for Community Life is uh, just beginning its, its life. Uh, I understand a $21 million uh, contract was just let for the project, and it's a joint city and school district project. Uh, what do you see as the benefits or the challenges of the project? And are there changes or improvements you would like to make? The, uh, this relationship between the city and the school district is now a fact, and we need to really come together as a community to make this a success. My niece, Fallon, has been going to Annie Yates, and of course, I'm concerned about this transition. And we need to uh, do things that involve the wider community to make this a success. I used to be a volunteer math tutor years ago for the high school. And this program didn't live on, and there is, it just wasn't coordinated well with the city. And we, if we can coordinate our efforts here, I think we will have a chance of having a very successful school district. Thank you. Diane. Uh, Scott Donu, Hugh, and I are, are um, endorsed by two members of the school board, John Alfelt and Christian Patz. And having met these men and talked to them extensively about ECCL, I feel like I feel confident that we've got good oversight in this process, in this endeavor, very expensive endeavor that we've entered into. However, as a parent, um, I do have concerns about the the structure and the amount of programming that we're trying to fit into uh, this campus. Uh, I'm very fond of Annie Yates. I think it's a, a well-designed and well-used campus, and I'm, I'm hesitant to let it go uh, until I'm able to see exactly how uh, ECCL will flow uh, between uh, the different grades. It's a K through 12 campus. That said, I'm a product of a, a K through nine education myself in LAUSD, and I know it can work with the proper support from strong leadership and administration and community. Thank you. John. Thanks. So the partnership that the school district and the city are endeavoring on is a really good one. It's going to be something, and it has already been something that's brought people together. So when we look at the benefits that this could provide, I think the first benefit is how involved the city got and how involved its residents got. And it was good to see that people cared. Um, I think that it's important to realize that sometimes the benefits aren't in bricks and mortar and that sometimes the benefits are the people. And that's the people who are invested in making something work and the people who are going to benefit from it over the next decade or two or three or four, hopefully forever. Um, we had the benefit of good oversight, as Scott and Diane mentioned, and I agree with them on that, and we will have the ability to continue that. So when we look at the challenges, I think we have to accept that the city council voted to approve this, and we had an 80% plus margin of people in the school district who voted for the bond measure. And so there is a general consensus in support of this. And so when we look at the challenge, the challenge is actually two things briefly. One is making sure that 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 we put forward to people and we said we were going to do becomes a reality but then we have the challenge of making sure that we see through every day that the children who go to school there are safe there that's my primary concern thank you um 
Are we on to the next question, I believe? Uh, well, no, you didn't. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ken. Please go ahead. Well, I think the ECCO is a great opportunity to bring the community together. And as I suggested earlier, if we could create a profile for the people in this community, we could find people, put people together with similar interests. We can create programs and ideas that we know people would be interested in. Uh, the whole thing is about bringing the community together and planning it together. I attended the school board retreat this past Saturday, and they were doing some planning for the ECCL, and I kind of thought, well, gee, you know, the city ought to be here as a part of this, because I'm not sure. I mean, they came together and they got the structure under construction, but I don't know if any of the planning for how it's going to operate has really been taking place yet, and so that, that needs to happen. But I think it's a great opportunity to bring the city together. I'm not sure if mixing the, the younger kids with the high school kids is the right idea, but, um, you know, and to your point about keeping any eights, the whole point of ECCL was to bring the facilities together into one school so that the city, the school could afford to operate. So if you're going to keep multiple facilities, then they're not going to have a sustainable budget. So that's, that's one issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Diane, uh, a Park Pacific Park Plaza resident submitted a question. Do you support the new standards for parkland spelled out in the current Emeryville General Plan? And specifically, what is your position regarding including the city-owned land from Christie Park down to 59th Street in the uh, proposed reconfiguration to partially correct the imbalance between the increasingly dense population of the Powell Christie Corps and the very small Christie Park, the only real neighborhood park in this corridor. This person has an opinion. <laughs> what is your opinion? Is uh, John Jackson in the room? <laughs> Hello. If, if this might be your question, um, thank you very much for the question. It's, it's a lengthy one, but I'll try to address it. I did speak to, um, I actually had the uh, chance to speak to Charlie Bright in person today about this issue. And um, it is one that it re will require great study. I intend to attend the community meeting on October 7th and uh, actually go down to the site. I feel like I need to see it with my own eyes, but I do understand that the park is underused. It is not big enough that it was um, possibly designed uh, aesthetically pleasing to be uh, beautiful, but it is, it, what's a park if it's not used? So we need to find out what makes a park usable and expand on those ideas. We, I, I absolutely agree that making, um, yes, for uh, how I feel about the general plan and open spaces, yes, we need more. I support more open spaces in Emeryville. I think that's what brings community together. I've seen that firsthand at Tabasco Creek Park, a huge change with the revamp, yes. Uh, John. So it, it was a long question, but I'm going to try to answer it, and I'd be happy to speak with you, uh, John. I got your email. I'd be happy to speak with you one-on-one -on -one about this further, because um, one minute won't cover it. But um, generally speaking, the general plan as it relates to parks and recreation is that we, in my opinion, it, you know, off the record, I would make the whole place a park if I could, because I'm an outdoor enthusiast and I love public space. And what we build with community, where we build community is in public space. And so when we look at whether a space is utilized, that's a land use question, right? It's not just a park question. Um, and I think that there are really good examples of people in the community like you who are trying to make better good use of our land. I know that some of my neighbors in the park district, uh, Park Avenue district area, are looking at using the 40th Street Bridge, the underside of that, as a potential dog space. Um, there's no place for dogs in the community and as a dog owner I would like to see that too and so for me the best response to a resident like you who has a neighborhood or community park that they have a concern or question over is what is the what is the benefit of it for you and what would you like to see have happen with it because I think that's what makes it usable is not just its land use it's its people use too. Ken what's yeah. your view on this? Yeah, I think uh, expanding the park is a good idea. I think the current uh, developers of the marketplace have a good plan for it. I think they're trying to get uh, a lot of community involvement. Uh, no, it really wasn't designed well since uh, it, you know, when we first created it. But uh, at least we did create some parks where we didn't have almost any parks at all before. And yes, I expand the, uh, the I support the idea of uh, expanding Christie Avenue Park. Thank you, Scott. I think uh, Emeryville is short on parks in acres per capita compared to our neighbors, and I think uh, we have a ways to go, and I think we need to really seriously considering 
consider expanding Christie Park. We need to build on the success of Doyle Hollis Park and study, well, what has made that park so well used and loved? Also, we have non-conventional parks like the Emeryville Greenway. This was a fab fabulous reuse of an old rail spur that has become a great public space. So we have a history of inventing new ways to create parks in our city, and we have to follow in on that and really study that location. And I plan, John, on attending that meeting, and I appreciate your attention to this. Thank you. I believe it's you're up next, John. Okay. And, uh, and we are going to go from local nature to nature in the large and in the future. What, this is an audience question, what specific initiatives will you offer to reduce the city's carbon footprint uh, and to help minimize global warming? Wow, you fed me like a favorite question. Um, so in my daily job, I'm an advocate for affordable home development. Um, and I travel around the state and I meet with communities that are looking for ways to do smart, sustainable growth. And you can't look at smart, sustainable communities through any individual lens. So even though I bring the housing component, I work with environmentalists, I work with people who do energy work, I work with transit people, and I work with people who do social and human services. And I think that one of the biggest things that we have available that I worked on recently this year is the development of cap and trade funds. Um, so cap and trade in a nutshell, because I have less than 60 seconds, cap and trade is basically a funding source that's going to come online here, it has come online, for communities to basically take funds that have been charged against polluters and use those funds for greenhouse gas reducing programs around the state and they've been divided up and some of those funds can be used for transit oriented development and we're in the stages of doing the guidelines and the framework on that at the state level but one of the potential uses is to develop affordable housing and energy efficient homes within a certain radius of a public uh, mass transit center and the Amtrak station offers us that opportunity to do that here in Emeryville. Ken. Okay, well, one of the first things I can say is, uh, you know, since I've been off the council, I became a videographer, and one of the things I do is I record all the meetings of the MTC and the Association of Bay Area Governments, and they have committees that deal with this particular issue. There are, there are grants and priority zones, and so the most important thing is to see the local people getting on board with what's happening in the region, because there's a real disconnect and a real lack of involvement. Because they, they deal with these issues, and they have experts there, and they have these different projects going on in the region, and Emmyville is not a part of, of a lot of those projects, which I think the city could be. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm an avid bike rider, and I've always been a supporter of bicycle issues. Uh, I used to be on the League of Cities Transportation Committee to support bicycle projects, and so, um, I'm a big supporter of finding ways to, uh, to uh, reduce our carbon footprint and, and for sustainability. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Scott. I think greenhouse gases are an incredibly important issue for us all going forward. We really are in potential trouble, and I think we really need to do something about it locally. We, need to, we can address it locally. We're here. We can do this in Emeryville. We can do things like put more solar on our buildings, cut a deal with uh, our county to make it so that we can have solar power being sold building to building. Currently, PG&E won't let us generate any one more power. So there's a way that we can make a decision in our immediate region that will allow us to save greenhouse gases that way. We can save greenhouse gases by having a different lifestyle, a walking, bicycling lifestyle that will really uh, reduce our personal uh, greenhouse gases. And I think that our designs for new development should include ground level, easily accessible bicycle with trailer parking. Take your bike and trailer to go get your food. Don't. Get in that car to go a half a mile, not needed. Thank you. Diane. So along these same lines, I've, I've got a multi-tiered uh, approach in terms of supporting intermodal uh, transit in Emeryville. We need to make sure that we are balanced with our use of public transportation in terms of buses, shuttles, um, and other options. Rail, like John, I know John takes the, uh, the train to work. Um, I'm also big on increasing bike and pedestrian access, and in addition to that, I'm interested in exploring options for managed parking and discouraging autos from 
going to places, you know, we won't stop them from going, but if we have managed parking, perhaps we can influence people to use bikes, to use their feet, to use public transportation to get to these businesses that are um, a draw in Emeryville regionally. Thank you. Um, how do the, I, I believe everybody answered, how do the digital businesses in towns uh, like P Pixar, Expressions, and many that I know nothing of, I'm sure, contribute to the economy and the life of the community? Are there any changes you'd like to see? And I believe it's Ken who starts. Okay, well, that's a good question. How do these businesses contribute? Well, one of the things that we need is an annual recognition event so we can find out what these businesses contribute and recognize the ones that do contribute. Because I don't know what a lot of these businesses contribute. I mean, we may get a certain amount of taxes from them, but uh, like Pixar, I mean, everybody thinks Pixar is so great, but Pixar isn't that great for Emmyville. They occupy a lot of land that could otherwise be used to bring more revenue into the city. And they're not the biggest contributors. They do contribute. But I don't really know all that they contribute, and I don't know what a lot of these other businesses Businesses contribute so I think finding out what they contribute is a good first step and recognizing those who participate and contribute would be a good way to, uh, to, to figure that out thank you very much Scott well uh, digital life is a part of all of our lives now and our local users heavy users of digital technology are going to be employing more and more people uh, even in what I do making permanent public art. Digital technology is happening there. The use of scanners and 3D printers, all of this is being affected by digital technology. And the uh, businesses that develop this are affecting our region. For example, in San Francisco, which has recently become a major center of digital technology development, software development, is really affecting the city of Emeryville with people moving here at a great rate. So I, I think we really have to consider that these industries are a major part of our future. Thank you. Diane. I'm a television and new media producer, so um, I have a special interest in this question. I don't know who asked it, though. I, I don't know what the level of participation is for these businesses outside of you know, getting to see Toy Story in the park, uh, at Doyle Hollis Park on a Saturday. Um, I was witness to some students from Expression College uh, presenting a video of uh, their version of Emeryville, and that was really wonderful. But I do think that there are ways that we can incorporate these businesses, if they were so willing, um, more into the city, because uh, I think these are modes of expression that are important to our culture, and I think they're valuable assets, and we should explore how we can partner with the city in order to, for instance, bring uh, more attention to what happens at city council and more involvement through social media. Thank you. John. Uh, yeah, I think what Diane was getting on at the end there is actually a really good point, and one I want to raise a little further is, you know, the we look at civic engagement. I know that a lot of residents in Emeryville are exasperated over lack of participation in civic engagement, and we had one of the lowest, lowest voter turnouts for a primary in all of Alameda County this year. And it begs the question, how do we reach our own community? And when we created housing that invited younger people and people who, like Scott noted, are in the tech industry probably, um, we brought in a group of people who access government and access resources differently than maybe we do traditionally. And I think that there's a mutual benefit that's available there. Um, I think that we need to invest in finding ways to bring people into the city's life and into the city's structure through social media and technology. And I think we have neighbors who could be more than neighbors, they could be community partners who could offer some of those services to us. Everything doesn't have to be based on taxes. Sometimes the good old barter system works. And sometimes we can just get people to volunteer and give the skills and time and resources they have to make our community better. And I think that that's something we should explore. Thank you. So we have just a little bit of time before we do our two minute closing statements. So I'm going to ask you something very unfair, but I think you can do it. What would be Please respond with just half a minute. What would be the impact if the ballot measures U and V failed? 
Uh, these are the measures that would enable the city to collect and use much higher transfer uh, sales taxes when buildings were sold. Uh, and I think it's Scott. What would happen immediately is nothing. What would happen over the next few years would be terrible. We would not be able to maintain our current infrastructure, much less build our new infrastructure that we need for going forward with our expanding population. So I think it's an important issue, and I think that this is a way that we can go on as a city and further develop where we need to go. Diane. 30 seconds. Uh, Scott's right. It's our capital improvement budget that will suffer. If there are potholes on the streets now and we can fill them, we won't be able to do it next year, coming years. This is a vitally important set of measures that's going to be able to enable Emeryville to provide the top tier services and be the city that people expect it to be. The people who came here to Emeryville to live because it's so beautiful and wonderful. We need to maintain this and these, these charter measures are, excuse me, these measures are going to be able to allow us to do that. Thank you. John. I think Scott's right as to the first question, which is what would happen? Nothing um, would be at the status quo if they didn't pass. Um, but as to the question about what would we look like in four or five years, I think that we need to answer that in two parts. I think the first part is that, yes, at the local level, we would be absent an important funding source that would help do capital improvement projects, like Diane properly noted, I think, that would really help sustain the community and do things that we need. But at the other hand, we need to start looking at it, and I hate to even say it, because Sacramento um, ditched us with redevelopment, but there are movements that I work on every day in Sacramento to bring about a, 2.0, redevelopment 2.0, and we need to be involved in that as much as we can at the regional and state level. Thank you. Ken. Okay, well, the city has been trying to uh, accomplish a real estate transfer tax for a long time, and becoming a charter city is the only way to do it. Um, I don't know. Uh, nothing will happen if it doesn't pass. We might not have funding for a few things. Uh, I would have been happier if we would have a, took a better look at what the potential impact was before we just put it on the ballot, but I do support the ballot measure. And I actually think becoming a charter city is a lot more important than the real estate transfer measure, so I strongly support the uh, charter city measure. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to have two minute closing statements. And you can look at me or you can look at the camera up there when you're making your statements, something I forgot to mention to you. So um, please tell us, and I believe we're starting with you, Diane, okay. why, uh, why should citizens of Emeryville vote for you to be on the city council? Well, I don't mean to single her out, but when I found out that Jennifer West wasn't running for re-election, I, uh, I was a little concerned that we were losing the voice, of, the strong voice of a parent of young children from city council, and she put out a call for candidates. I felt inspired to take that call because I saw a void in the future of uh, the city's leadership. I've been in Emeryville since 2010, and in that time, I've gone from renter to homeowner. I've gone from uh, married woman to parent. Uh, I'm still married, sorry, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I, I decided to run for city council seven months ago, and when I did that, since I've did that, I've attended every single city council meeting. I'm a member of, of Residents United for a livable Emeryville. I've put my roots down in this city. I intend to stay, and I want to make it a better place. I'm running on a slate with Scott Donahue because he and I share many of the same values. Among them, we believe that public transportation is a linchpin in our community. Emory Go Round must be supported. It must be protected. That's really important to us. Bicycle, pedestrian access must be prioritized. There are places in the city where it it's unsafe to cycle or be on foot, frankly. Uh, public safety, we need to make sure that our police and fire services are adequately staffed, especially in the case of an emergency. We don't want to find that out afterwards. There's not enough affordable housing in this uh, community. I think everyone agrees about that, and Scott and I plan to do something about it. You know, we've been campaigning for the past seven months, and we've been talking to the community, community members, and we've been listening to them, and we've earned the endorsements of several key figures in Emeryville, among them Alameda County Firefighters Local 55, Alameda County Democratic Party, the Sierra Club, Rule, 
Unite Here Local 20, 2850, Mayor Jack Asher, Vice Mayor Ruth Atkin, Council Member Nora Davis, Council Member Jennifer West. We've garnered their support. I hope we, we get yours too. Thank you. John. Thanks. So in answering the question why to vote for me, I guess the best thing for me to do is to put forward the reasons why I think I'm running in the first place. Um, I have, a, I have a history of being a pragmatist and a consensus builder. And I've done that in the areas that are important to the people of the city based on the interactions I've had as a resident and as somebody who works on a daily basis to make communities like this stronger. Um, I've worked for the Red Cross. I worked doing disaster relief work, bringing together the federal government, FEMA, bringing together local communities and people who were affected by disaster stability. I worked as a uh, legal aid attorney for seven years and represented seniors, low-income people, and people who were experiencing homelessness in housing, public benefits, and veterans issues. And in those types of experiences, I had to work very closely with people who had oppositional points of views. I'm a realist. I understand that not everything goes the way we always want it to, but it's most important that we listen to people and we understand and respect divergent viewpoints. And I've had the ability through those experiences to really hone my skills and make sure that the places that I'm working in as an advocate and the people that I'm serving get the best representation that they deserve and that the causes that matter to the people that I serve move forward progressively. Currently, I serve as the director of policy at Housing California, where I do affordable housing and homelessness. Uh, I call it eradication. My boss would probably prefer I said alleviation work. Um, but one way or the other, I'm doing work that's better, that's built around building stronger and more stable communities. And so I believe I bring the skills that are necessary to be a successful council member, but I also bring a good deal of experience on the issues of public safety, housing, energy efficiency, transit-oriented development, and affordable homes to the community that we all live in. Thank you. Uh, Ken. Okay. <clears throat> well, I've been here for 37 years, been involved in the community for the, almost the whole time. Um, you know, during my tenure, I asked a lot of questions, which uh, met with lots of resistance. You, you're not, you can't question the staff or anything that they want to do, and, and that becomes a problem. But I see a lot of great opportunities here. I see a lot of opportunities to bring people together. I filed to run for city council because I thought Scott and Diane were going to just walk away with the election without having an election, and I thought that would be unacceptable. We have to have at least an election so that you can get the feedback of people. Uh, John came along at the last day. Nobody expected him to be there, but welcome. I'm glad to see that you're here. So um, I'm a full-time public servant. I'm retired. I spend all my time working on videos for the city. So in one in last year, I posted 1,300 videos of city meetings. Some of them go back 25 years. I'm creating a complete city archive of videos, and then I'm working at the regional level, and I spend my time at ABAG, MTC, County Transportation. So I'm all about transparency, public involvement, and seeing what we can do to make your life better. I think the, the city should have a focus on what can we do for the residents? How can we save you money? Can we have community choice aggregation and put PG&E in the back seat? Uh, can we save money on insurance? Can we put people together with similar interests? Uh, I think there's a lot of great things we can do, and I'm just going to keep trying for as long as I'm here to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Scott. Well, I just want to thank everybody for coming to this meeting and paying attention to Emeryville. Uh, and for the people at home, the same goes for you. You're paying attention to our city. And I have... Uh, considered running for council five years ago, and I was talking to Jennifer West about this, and I decided that I would support her campaign, and I helped get her elected, rather than divide the vote between us, and I think uh, it was a good investment. Jennifer, thank you for your service. I've been involved a long time in this city because I, like Ken, have been here for 37 years, and uh, I've done lots of different things in a civic way. I've volunteered as a math teacher at the high school. I've served for more than 10 years on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee and uh, really fought for that greenway that has really proven to be a good thing. I think everyone would agree on that. Uh, I've really, uh, with Diane, we have are really concerned about our transit system and making sure that we have transit for everyone including our elderly citizens and the uh, the H service has got to be maintained and I'm really concerned about bicycle and pedestrian interconnectivity because I know that this will help us in the long run reduce our greenhouse gases and make a better community. Public safety is something that has given our city a real region-wide respect because 
we really do have good public safety services. We've got to maintain them. And uh, of course, we need more affordable housing, and I hope to participate with create some new creative solutions about that. Diane and I have been endorsed by so many of the regional and local players in our community, and uh, among them the Sierra Club, Alameda County Democrats, Party and uh, the Alameda County Firefighters, Residents United for Livable Emeryville, Mayor Jacqueline Asher, Council Member Ruth Atkin, Council Member Nora Davis, of course, Council Member Jennifer West. And I just uh, could go on with our endorsements, and I will. I'm so pleased that uh, Bill Reuter, our financial uh, committee chair, has endorsed this. And I just uh, know that when we shared our values with these people, they ended up supporting us, and I hope we can get your support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, candidates, for your very uh, well-informed and, and interesting responses to our questions. And thanks to the audience for your excellent questions and your attention. And uh, thanks very much to the city clerk and the city of Emeryville for supplying the meeting room and the recording of this forum. So this forum, for those aren't, who aren't lucky enough to have been here this evening, um, will be replayed repeatedly on the city cable channel. It will probably be posted to the city YouTube channel, and it'll also be posted to the League of Women Voters of Berkeley, Albany, and Emeryville YouTube channel. So you can replay and re-listen to and re-study the uh, fascinating comments of these candidates uh, at any hour of the day and night, and so can your friends and neighbors. So no reason not to be an informed voter, and we can help you with that too, because we have uh, pros and cons on the ballot measures sitting outside the doors here and available online at our lwvbae.org website. Uh, Please also consult smartvoter.org and votersedge.org um, to learn all about the ballot measures and the candidates. Um, thank you very much for watching. Your vote does make a difference, so please be sure to register before October 20th and vote on November 4th. Thank you very, very much.